What's up? It's Tommy Green. You're listening to the Rev Talks podcast brought to you by the Rev Gatherings, digital tribe of up-and-comers, emerging leaders, <laughs> doing our best to keep in step as the face of the church changes in our generation. If this is your first time checking out the podcast, welcome home. If you are a returning visitor, hiya. Feel free to subscribe, share it around, give us a five-star review. Tell somebody. If you like what you hear, please let us know. You can reach out to us at therevgatherings.com. Feel free to email us at therevgatherings at gmail.com. Hope you enjoy the episode. See you on the other side. Welcome to the Rev Talks podcast, my good friend Dave. Hi. Hi. Hey, it's good to be here. <laughs> I remember it just made you look at our dog and that Chrissy Green is just jamming. She she wants to stay so so okay. <laughs> so, okay, hi. Um thank you for waiting for me. We I I had such a wild morning with I literally felt like buried under the like tension of Corona camp and I was oh, yeah. like I got to get we've got to do something. So we just went to this park and uh, let the kids run around and actually got them out of the house because I feel like, oh my God, good for oh you, my man. God, get Yeah, out good for them. So, okay, well, welcome, welcome. Okay, so for those of the people that don't know you yet, can you yeah. please tell everyone sort of who you are and where you are and what you do with yourself? Sure. Um, my, yeah, yeah. Uh, well... My name is Dave Wilton. I live in Colorado with my wife, Allie, and our three kiddos. And, um, yeah, since I was fairly young, I knew music was going to be, like, it for me. And so I do uh, a lot of things in music. I'm in two different bands, uh, one band being Loud Harp with my great, great friend, Asher Safink. Come on! Yeah, uh, and um, and then my own project's called The Boy and His Kite. And, and besides that, I have kind of dedicated much of my adulthood to learn how to, like, make records uh, for people and run a studio, a recording studio, and cultivate sound and, mm. in some sense, kind of like pastor songs with artists because <laughs> uh, some of them need wrangling and um, they're wild and so anyways th- that's what I do I spend my day working with songs and artists and sound so awesome so awesome okay so um what all do you play well a lot of things not so great uh I I started as a drummer Come and on. then uh the best of right? us yeah yeah I know do. Yeah, uh, and then it kind of got to the point where I was like, I knew I had melody in me, mm. and banging things was really fun, but I just wanted to do more. So my dad played guitar growing up. He had this rad old Gibson 12-string, and I like would sneak in when he didn't know and strum it and be like, ah, oh, you're yeah. my future. <laughs> so then uh, I started learning guitar, and weathered all the painful calluses on my fingers yes and then um as early as i really as early as i remember we had a piano in the house and so my mom had me learn piano which is great um how old were you when you started i was young enough where i couldn't say no (laughs) (laughs) i didn't really enjoy it if i'm honest my teachers were rather strict and um I was a little bit too free spirited. Yeah. Practice to me was like, "Are you kidding? I have to do something someone else wrote? Why?" Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I learned some cool things and love the sound of piano. And anyway, so piano and drums are my first instrument, and then guitar. And my brother uh, Dan, he, I'm a twin, which is the best. Um, and so he played bass, and I played guitar, and we just grew up playing in bands and. Um, so I learned how to play bass out of necessity when I didn't live near my brother. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, man, I've tried to learn lots of instruments, but most of the basic like rock band instruments I know how to play. Cool. 
cool. That Rod of Green, like my little boy, uh-huh. I think he wants to play guitar, but I don't. I don't think he's a performer. I think he's. Yeah. Like, I think he's going to be like. I think his head's like math science. So I think he's like. I wonder if I think he could just be like a player, and then yeah. um, that Piper. The uh-huh. Piper Piper, she's a singer. She just sings her butt uh-huh. off. But yeah. I, we have a piano that Chrissy's mom gave us, and I constantly go like, I think they should just probably learn piano just out of basic necessity. And then Piper flirts sometimes with like, I want to play flute, and I'm like, Well, you look like a little woodwind player, so you should probably. Totally. But, um, <laughs> that's super cool, man. Okay, so then, well, I, I had a couple of things I was thinking about. Yeah. Okay, so a boy in his kite. You just released a new record. How long yep. did you work on it? And um, take just a second and let yeah. people know about that. The newest project, the newest the boy in his kite project. Yeah, I worked about a year on it, um, and it was oh man, it was so good. Really healing journey for me. It was the new record is mostly my process of healing and self. Um, my own personal therapy sessions with God <laughs> about um, a journey that my wife, uh, we all, our family went through when she had breast cancer. Mm-hmm. And we're so rejoicing and glad that she's cancer free and all that stuff. But um, come, on, come on. Yeah, man. Art, I just came across this beautiful, beautiful quote today, man. I'll, I took a screenshot. Didn't yeah. know why. Now I do. Um, I don't know who this is. Dario Robletto but on being just posted this today. And it said, he said, if you could put on the table everything anyone's ever made in a moment of loss, it would tell as beautiful a history of aesthetics and creativity as the proper art history that we all know. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh man, that's so true. <laughs> when people encounter suffering and loss and uh hardship the human spirit uh can't help itself but express hope in the midst of uncertainty and hardship you know and that's to me where some of the most beautiful things have come from and so uh for me i tried to participate in you know what he's saying uh, i yeah i tried to participate in that and i'm really happy uh, with what I what I made, and um, I hope it blesses lots of people. It already has for us, I know for sure. I think that the idea, the first song that I just fell in love with, I listened to it over and over again. I was mm-hmm. so appreciative of. I think I love the bass line a lot, but the. So I'm just going to ask you, just because I hadn't even thought about it, but I'm going to now. So, is uh, talk about time. Yeah. What was that about? It's like my favorite. I'll, oh, I, still, so cool. I, I have it on repeat. It's probably yeah. going to be on my, you know, when you do your Spotify list of like songs. Yeah, you yeah, listen, yeah. It's going to be on there because it, it's yes. been, that's what time, it's all we have. Or, or uh, yeah. Time, yeah. Just the way that you looked at it, I so appreciate it. But yeah, talk about that song a little bit just for my yeah. own benefit. Totally. Well, yeah, man, when we face um, those those moments in life, uh, that are not welcome, <laughs> but they, they force us to have an accounting session with our lives and with the time we have here. Mm-hmm. And I've been, man, I've been thinking through it for a long time. Uh, I've been wanting to write a song about time for the last four or five years. Ever mm-hmm. since I started having kids, I started, I felt like I had a different relationship with time. And um, every month when you have kids, it's, there's something whoa, like a month. I never felt a month like that before. <laughs> and days, you know, days feel different with kids. Um, That's true. So, so yeah, I, I knew it was in me. I had a bunch of weird ideas. But just one night I came up to my studio. Um, it was the first time I allowed myself to come up to the studio post Allie's surgeries and her recovery. I had not a ton in my tank, you know, Um, because I was trying to just empty myself, loving and caring for Allie and our kids. Um, And I just felt something. 
when people write songs, they, some people hear it in their head and all that stuff. But for me, I'm like, I look at an instrument and it like, it's like, pick me up, you oh, know? Really? It's okay. a really weird, like, like I have this, in all my instruments, I feel like I, I really have a friendship with them because they help me discover things, you know? So I looked at my SG and I was like, my hands started getting warm and I was like, whoa, okay. So I grabbed my electric guitar and that bass part came out. I never played anything like that before. It it, it, it never ended. It, it, I mean, it revolved, but it never yeah. ended on a chord, you know? Yeah. And I was like, I've never done that before. And it just, honestly, it, um, it happened really spontaneously. And I had this moment where it was um, just a beautiful moment of uh, self-expression. And I picked up a mic and uh, with no nothing in my mind, really, just started singing from as honest of a place as I can muster. And uh, I started singing about time. And so a lot of the lyrics that you hear, and especially the chorus, it's all we have, came in that very first muttering of me responding to that feeling that was in my hands. And, and once I realized the song was about time, then I got really excited. Yo. And I, I started like, okay, so how do I creatively uh, express this? And so, yeah, so the, the, I, I'm really pleased with the song. I'm, I, I love the, the poetry of it. I think I was able to express my own relationship with time yeah. and my own desire to make the most of it, um, to not run from it, um, to, to meet it, you know? Um, so, so, yeah. So dope. I do think it's really interesting. It doesn't sound like a lot of the other stuff that you've done to me. Yeah. When I heard it, I was like, well, this is different. And then, <laughs> but it was so, uh, it, there was a lot of peace on it for me, but it also like, it was like the right notes. And I love the way that you talk about, like, it doesn't resolve where you think it, I like the steps. I just like the way yeah. that it's, I'm like, Oh, that sounds so good. Okay. Well, that's really makes awesome. That makes me really excited to pick your brain about it. Um, yeah. And then, uh, that's okay. That's wild. So I'm, I'm trying to figure this out because in my mind, I just think what you and Asher have contributed kind of what we talked about it a while ago. I think it was a couple months ago when I called, yeah. I was just like, listen, I'm not, I, here's a better preface. I just yeah. had a conversation with my friend. Uh, he just did this last week's podcast with cool. me. It's a pastor from Chicago, uh -huh. and he was talking about the journey that a lot of people are on in this kind of what their their faith is being renovated or, you know, and he yeah. said, it's not something you like volunteer for. You don't just jump into like, oh, this is the new cool thing to do. It sort yeah. of happens to you. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think I, I've been clinging to a first love kind of relationship yeah. with jesus yeah by the skin of my teeth yeah. and in a lot of ways there is a lot of that stuff that's happening to me because yeah. of um the all of the death that we've gone through i think there's a lot of shallow answers there's a lot of kind of false prophecy there's a lot of, there's just a lot of stuff that i've realized i've taken on yeah, in my so journey. much Right. So, and so you like, you talk. So in talking with you a couple months ago, I remember saying like, who do you listen to for worship? Because yeah. they're not putting out a record. They're like, yeah. they actually are carrying something. And so yeah. I'm saying all that to say what you and Asher have contributed to our community. I know is like so much life. Like mm -hmm. there's so much beauty and and there's a sincerity and there's a substance to it. And that's like that I know. I know that you've had that impact on the fan base of Loud Harp, like yeah. its own unique little universe. Yeah. <laughs> there's a tribe of people that are like, they sing my song. And so yeah. like, that's real. Um, talk a little bit about forming Loud Harp with yeah. Asher. Kind of what, what was that? Because I'd love to circle around to this to the degree that we can, this kind of amazing origin story of 
how yeah. you really were able to write your own music in the midst mm -hmm. of producing other people's, the relationship you had with Loud Harp and its first records. And we just catch everybody up on Loud Harp because if yeah. you don't, before you go there, if for anyone that's listening, if you don't know, Loud Harp is probably one of the like top maybe three or four things I will listen to in the worship space because of the depth on the records. So um, Dave and our dear friend Asher are in an amazing group called Loud Harp. Please buy all of their stuff, buy records, <laughs> buy things, sell their records for them and send them money, like just support them <laughs> however you can. Um, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so talk a little bit about how, what was Loud Harp? How did it start? What was going on for you? Yeah, um, well, that's a fun story. I think it's, to preface it, it's it's really, for me, and Asher may have a, a slightly different take of it, so he, you should have him on the podcast to ask him too, but for me, it's a story of friendship, um, of friendship, learning to become a friend with God, learning mm -hmm. to become a friend with Asher, yeah. learning to also, sound strange, but be a friend to myself. Um yeah. So Loud Harp was, I heard Asher sing for the first time in my, like, I don't know how to articulate how I felt when I heard him sing, but I was like, there's no one that sings like him. That's true. And, and I felt so much of his yearning and so much of his, um, who he is. I felt, you know, yeah. he was so... Yeah, the dude is a gift uh, from God to the world. And when he yeah. sings, he shares it, you know. So, And he's doing a bunch of other amazing things too. And I think everything he does is great. But there is something crazy powerful when he sings. So I heard that and I kept being like, dude, you know, maybe you should make a record. And he's like, I, I did that once and it wasn't. And I could tell he was wounded, you know. Mm -hmm. Um so I pushed on him a bit and found out that somebody who had kind of this sense of, uh, you know, of, uh, quote unquote, you know, spiritual authority or a older brother or father, someone who basically had too much weight, uh, told Asher that his voice wasn't good. What? And that his, uh, his calling was just like, not to be uh basically just full on said things that I was it hurt me and I wept because I knew the guy that said it mm. and I was like that's bullshit yeah and so I called the guy and was said hey you said this to Asher and it's wrong can you please come and and apologize and ask and 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 I basically forced a meeting and then the guy, the guy came and totally repented and said, I'm so yes. sorry. And, and it freed Asher, you know, no. he was still wounded. Obviously you don't recover that quickly over stuff like that, especially when it's like one of your heroes, you know, mm. you know, Christian celebrity heroes. Sure. <laughs> sure. And, uh, so anyways, that began kind of our friendship because I said like, no, that's total BS. Yeah. And you're believing something that isn't true. Yeah. So once we figured that out, uh, then we started this cool friendship of I could be like, hey, are you going to sing? <laughs> and so the first time we got Loud Heart began because he was going through a real dry season of not knowing what to write about. Uh, he, he was in a job that wasn't fulfilling to him. And uh, I think it might have been even Halen that was like his wife, Halen. Mm -hmm. He's like, go, go hang out with Dave. <laughs> and yeah. uh, not that I had any answers. I just wanted to be his friend, you know. And, um, and so he came from Utah and uh, we were going to write for his new Seafinch record. Um, his first Seafinch record's great and I helped produce that as well. But anyways, we, we sat down to write and like, uh we just got totally rant like 
that God just came to visit us and we didn't have any um, say in it, you know. Uh, he, we both were trying to write like these heartfelt indie emo songs from Asher's heart. And for whatever reason, there was a Bible in the room and we kept opening the Psalms and getting wrecked by God. And, and so the first Loud Harp record uh, was written over two nights. Uh, oh, wow just two nights mm. of like opening the Bible together and feeling God's presence and singing songs. Yeah. Spontaneously. So, wow. um, and that's kind of sums up me and Asher's relationship. You never really know what's going to happen. We're quite different. Um, but we, we really share a, a kindred heart yeah. for God and for people. We both grew up listening to the same music. I, he yeah. has, he's like a savant when it comes to listening to music. The guy has consumed more beautiful music and probably trashy music than any human I know. Um, that's, that's, yeah. he just takes it all in. He takes you know? it in. Wow. Yeah, I, I like, he, he can consume so much, uh, which is amazing. Um, and so he would send me these records and they'd really touch me. And then I'd have these sounds that, I was inspired by that he sent me. So he and I just started making music. I mean, this will be funny, but I didn't even own a reverb pedal before the first Loud Harp record. Wild. Like, Shut up. like the first Rat Loud Harp record was like one reverb pedal and a delay, like my first memory man delay pedal. That was me just exploring new sounds, you know? Yeah. I didn't, I wasn't trying to be shoegaze. I was just was like, oh, cool, a new toy. <laughs> And uh, so, so yeah, so, so our friendship, man, it's like, so I'll turn it off. our friendship has always been about wanting the best for each other mm. and then trying to be healed, trying to be like actually touched by God and really uh, vulnerable and wounded places of our hearts. Um, mm. And when we get together, we just can't help it, but. I would say I've cried around Asher more than any other human. And, yeah. um, and that's a really good sign of friendship and trust. Mm-hmm. It's also for me a really good sign that God's present because I can, you know, I love being in worship things, but like when I feel God's presence, I cry. Yeah. I don't know what else to do. Yeah. Um, so I don't get all fiery. I get all like weepy <laughs> and like, I love you too. You know, I get real sweet. And, uh, <laughs> so awesome. Um, so yeah, so that's loud art, man. It's real honest songs. Most of them are from, from the Psalms. Um, because if I've learned anything from the Psalms, it's that God can handle any human emotion, any human thought, any human action is not, too great or bad or too crazy for God. Like, he loves our humanity. And um, when we can give him back our humanity uh, as worship, I think he's just like in it. In know? fact, I, <clears throat> that's my only, I would say that's my only experience is the best songs, the best songs that I feel like I've ever had a chance to be a part of in that neighborhood, I feel like go both ways. Yes. And so I think I, I, I hear what you're saying in that. I think that's really, really good. Okay, let me ask you this, because you've done all of them. What's, what's a Loud Harp song that, that you still, what's the one you resonate the most with right now? Because, you know, you get tired of them, like in the beauty of it. It's like, okay, I'm, I, this is done. Like, I've listened yeah. to this 600 times. We've mastered every single part of this, like, I just need a break from it. But like, where does your heart still kind of come online in, in, in listening? What's one where you're like, dang, that is real deal for me. Yeah. Well, it's a joy as an artist to be able to look back and not be embarrassed of any of them, you know, um, to just be like, yeah, that's totally real and still feels a part of me. The two songs that I think continually uh, pop into my spirit are um, Take Heart and the song Steady. Yes. 
So the, those two, um, especially in the season, you know, we need people like, God bless the American church, but let's be honest, she doesn't know how to mourn. She doesn't know how to encounter any pain or suffering. She doesn't know how to lament. Mm. Uh, she only knows privilege and she only knows power for the most part, at least within white evangelicalism. Um, and, and I was just so honored to take part in songs that are old, that people, my, you know, mothers and fathers of the faith before me that had to actually encounter true persecution, true struggle, true adversity, not, oh, they're going to take away my guns or I can't sing on a stage in front of a thousand people. Dude, if I hear that one more time, I'm going to vomit. Yeah. It's so gross. They know nothing mm. about the suffering of God. And guess what? You can't participate in the glory of God apart from his suffering. Come on. So those two songs to me have endured because the bride's been suffering, man. Yeah. And um, and I'm grateful to be a part of those old songs of lament and um, understanding that God actually suffers with us. Um, he's healer. He's great, the great physician. He's all those things. But um, but more than that, he's abiding love. He's just with us yeah. in the midst of it. So I'm I'm really uh, proud of those two songs. So epic. Hmm. Well, tell me a little bit about, gosh, talk a little bit about the miracle that is. The boy <laughs> and his kite and your first project. Because I don't know if people actually know. I mean, yeah. you've, got, you've got fans, you've got people that would know. But like within kind of the hardcore scene or like people that would be listening to this within our community, I don't know if they know the origin story. And it's so wild. So I just it's super like, wild. Yeah, I, I talk about that a little bit and go into it because I just think it'll kind of blow people's minds. Yeah, I, okay, so it's been years. I've almost worked in music a full decade, um, helping people just learn in a craft, you know, as yeah. we all do. And so many of my friends and artists, um, They'd be like, play me a song, you know, and I'd be like, well, you know, and I'd occasionally play them one of my songs and they were all so supportive and so encouraging and wanted me to make my own music. Yeah. And so I took that to heart, but it wasn't until a rather mystical <laughs> encounter with God um, where I felt like commissioned to make something. Like, not just like, oh, I'm going to make a record. It's a great idea. Or, I think I need money, so let's do this. Uh, it was like a for real encounter with the divine where uh, in the most peaceful and loving and yet intense way, um, he gifted me, you know, the greatest, like a dream I've had since I was a boy was to, to make my own music. And um, yeah. and I had kind of laid that down to help people. Um, wow. So that happens. And as a result, I, you know, I'm like, I'm going to do it. And so we set aside three weeks. And that first week was that first Loud Harp record. We recorded it. Yeah. And then the second two weeks, I recorded my own music, Buenos Kite. Asher was there for a few days of the session. Like it was like a friends and family affair, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I write these songs and most of them are spontaneous. I wasn't trying to like be hip or cool or whatever. And I write this one song called Cover Your Tracks and it, it happened so fast. I wrote it in like five minutes. And um, I just remember when it, came it felt so real and pure mm. but I didn't understand it I didn't know I didn't have a cognitive understanding of what I was saying but it was the first time I'd ever like directly spoken to my mind my heart and my spirit and told it kind of what's up told it what to do whoa and um and it was this empowering moment for me so I, I write you record the song so one day, my co-producer, Latifa Alata, she's awesome. 
Uh, she's in the bands Page Six VI and Moda Spira. Um, anyway, she was like, "Hey, Twilight's taking submissions," and I was like, "The book?" And she like, she's like, "The film, Twilight." And I was like, submissions for what? And she's like, Dave, get with it. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, I have three kids under three. I'm not sleeping. Um, yeah. I don't even know. And I, st- and I, so I look and the soundtracks are like gorgeous, like Radiohead, Bon Iver, like all these incredible artists that I love and respect are on these, this vampire and werewolf movie. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's interesting. So, uh, so I, I was like, well, I'll talk with Allie, uh, my wife. Because the truth is, I'm not like a huge fan of vampirism. Um, uh, you know, I'm not like, it's just not, or shapeshifters and stuff. It's just not my thing. Yeah. Uh, but I go and I tell Allie, hey, uh, Tifa wants me to submit a song for Twilight. And she goes, do it. They're going to pick it. Do cover your tracks. And I was like, really? Shut up. And I was like, uh, okay. So I got her blessing. And uh, we sent uh, her placement in music industry. There's these uh, licensing agents that, that try to connect filmmakers and commercial advertising people with songs. And so we sent it to this her licensing agent, real sweet dude. Um, and the next day, he said, send me everything he's ever done and I was okay so I, so I sent him my whole um these are roughs man like demos you know the yeah, yeah 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 like, not is, even full you, vocal you wrote in your own house and that was yeah it. and so I send it uh and I get this thing like a week later saying your song is being considered and I was like, oh, that's so sweet. You know, I'm seriously not even getting my hopes up. So then I'm out on tour with my old friend, Ryan O'Neill, who's in a band sleeping at last. And we're in New Haven, Connecticut. We were opening. I was playing like bass and guitar and piano for him on, on a little, e- well, like a th- two week or three week East Coast tour. Oh, wow. And, um, and we were opening for Christina Perry. So Christina Perry and Ryan had both had songs in the previous Twilight film, right? Oh, I didn't know that. Crazy. Yeah, okay. yeah huge, right. huge, huge songs. Ryan's song's beautiful. It's called Turning Page. And Christina Perry's song was called like A Thousand Years. And anyways, oh yeah, okay. Ryan's song is actually in this like mad sex scene where they're having oh, sex yeah, for bro. the first time, dude. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> he like break. Bed. it's so awkward anyways but <laughs> so so we're on tour and um i mean it's all so romantic and beautiful but it's you know it's hollywood that's sex so right. funny because you Are write you, the song and then I'll yeah, you're not gonna oh, think, that's that's yeah. what it's connected to forever more totally. so <laughs> yeah so dude and he's like the sweetest purest person too so that's also why it made it so funny to me but <laughs> um yeah so so we're on tour we're in this place called toad's place did you ever play toad's place in new haven it smells no okay. it's right across from yale anyways it's like the it's it's this old venue man uh, and it has kind of catacombs vibe in the basement, and it smells sure. like urine. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, you know, you know the scene. So uh, we're, and I get this call from the, my licensing agent, and he said they just put the song under contract. Don't tell anybody, you know. Yeah, but I'm with like two Twilight artists, so of course I tell them, and it's really sweet. But like they're like, it may not happen. It may not happen. Sure, sure. Yeah. You know, even though they put it under contract, it, it may not happen. They may cut the scene or whatever. So, long story short, it's I'm, I'm back home from tour. Uh, we had just moved into a new home. I remember it being a Thursday, um, and I get this call, and they're like, they're announcing the soundtrack tomorrow, and he, and he's like. You have no website. You have no social media. Get your shit together, man. <laughs> it was like, I, was, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so I'm a, so the next day, I'm nobody. And I get put on this. 
I'm on a soundtrack with freaking Green Day and Feist. Yeah. And um, all these other beautiful artists, you know. And I'm just some guy in Colorado that's trying to remain sane with three small children and yeah. help my artist friends. And that just was such a blessing, man. That, that was, that took me from instantly, my very first thing I ever recorded and released went to number three on Billboard. That's ridiculous, you know? So super blessed, man. It's just, it's a miracle story. I didn't deserve it, but I'm so grateful for it. And I, and I've tried to be a good steward of all the, the monies that came in, all of the um, opportunities that came in. I've tried to, Allie and I really tried to um, be generous with it. And uh, yeah, we're, great, we're, cool. just, we're just grateful for, I love Twilight. I love Twilight fans and they, they honestly were an immensely supportive community and still are. That's wild, man. What, so, okay. What, when you say that, what do you mean? I mean, Twilight fans, um, they, they resonated so deeply with these books and these stories mm-hmm. and these characters and they became sources of hope and it became a story of like overcoming and a story of uh taking a uh, i mean if if vampires and werewolves can can have love and and overcome evil any of us can mm. and um and and like i said i'm still not huge like into that like per se lifestyle if people choose to give themselves over to some of that stuff. I don't think that's life. Um, I'm not a fan of that. Yeah. Um, however, the story and the community around Twilight, I think was really special. That's so wild, man. <clears throat> what was the most, okay. Most surreal moment connected. To yeah. Experience. Most surreal moment is um, they flew me out to LA for the premiere Dude, I'm like an, an, a slightly, you know, I'm pretty introverted <laughs> and a homebody. And um, I've always been a reluctant singer and front man. I love it so much to get to out and perform and stuff. But like, whereas I could see you, you like relish the opportunity to connect with all those people. That yes. feels very scary for me, mm. you know. Um, and so I fly out we do the red carpet thing, but before the red carpet, it wasn't just, red, it was a black carpet because it was Twilight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So uh, really I love it. They were so sweet though, dude. Seriously. That was my first time ever in California. Hmm. Well, it's just nuts. But they're like, Hey, would you perform for the Twilight fans? I was like, sure. I didn't realize it would be the whole LA live between the Staples center and the Nokia center. So like over 5,000 Twilight fans. Whoa. So they had just released the soundtrack uh, that morning. Mm-hmm. I get up on stage and start singing the song. They all knew it already. Knew the words. Oh, my gosh. Bro. And we're singing it. I was like, what the heck? <laughs> uh, that was the most surreal where I was like, don't mess up. Don't mess up. But there was a moment where, yeah, you kind of just lose yourself. And at the end of it, you're like, what happened yeah but everyone was so kind all the fans were so kind wow holy smokes man that's wild that's yeah wild. super crazy well let me let me do this then i guess because that's kind of fun to think through is like um i think in in talking a little bit about like the maybe praise worship performance professional right like professional professional recording christian artists yeah um there's a whole bunch of people that have the potential they are going to be the next song leaders you know psalmists hymn writers you know tell me a little bit about what you think should stay and what could go in the Christian music sort of industry or world that you've experienced? Because I know you produce, you produce people, you work with artists, and there's a lot of people on the outside looking in 
that just so need praise and worship they can connect with. It helps them in their daily life. And then there's also the other side of it for people that don't understand this, that where the bodies are buried. And so in a lot of ways, like there's a good and a bad to praise and creativity and commerce and pop culture and where that meets can be kind of messy. So I would imagine that you have a lot of experience in, in seeing it and in working with people. What's the best, what's like the best parts of it and what stuff that you really want people to be cautious of for the generation coming up behind us? Yeah. You know, what's the thing to go like, Hey, snap out of that. That's not real this, this is what's real. I think for someone that has more experience, a bit more, uh, higher level of maybe encounters with people. Again, we get, if you get to know the rock stars, oh, yeah, yeah. Just go like, <laughs> don't ever meet your heroes, man. Cause they suck. But like, so yeah. that's fine. They're just, we're just people. But if you could speak to what's the, what's the thing that's life giving within that culture, what's some stuff that people really need to be aware of? Oh man. We don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I guess I'm just wondering, like, hey, speak no, no, to I, 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 was, I would I'll feel like, you. I would I'll feel weird you. not going, hey, you know how we, like, there's a level of hypocrisy in, in most things, and I get that. Yeah. This is a really precious, if you're a worshiper, this is yeah. a really precious place. And so I'm just wondering, like, what you would, if you could coach the kids. Yeah. I will. I will. I think that would be cool. You know, more of an encouragement than like a crap talking or a self righteous. No, you know what I mean? It's like that's yeah. me, not you. I'm saying I could go off. I'll just be like the worst guy ever. But it's like <laughs> I, if you could, if you could encourage the next generation of kids coming up. I will. What I will. I, what an honor! What an honor! Firstly, thanks, Tommy. I, Heck yeah, man. Um, I guess my my encouragement is that to recognize. What God loves more than anything is not worship. It's mm. people. Mm. And um, he loves people so much that he gave himself for us. He like poured himself out for us. And so when we as worship leaders and as leaders of spiritual communities, um, when we invite them into uh, a moment of God's presence and we invite them into a moment of being touched by the divine. Um, never lose sight that God's love is first and foremost for us, mm. for all of humanity. Um, right now, it's this isn't just a... Um, a worship industry thing. It's this is a social thing that I'm going to speak to. So, if there are any worship leaders that are listening, this is no condemnation. This mm-hmm. is simply, I think, speaking from now. You know, I've been doing this since I was really since I was 17, um, and I'm almost 37, so almost 20 years mm-hmm. um, of leading worship and music and being in the industry and being a, you know, being a darling where everyone wants to be my friend and also being like, don't trust that Dave guy, you know. So I've I've seen both sides. Um, There is industry is the, is a form. It's a needed economical thing within the the structure and framework of capitalism, of, of society. We need to prov- to do good things and make products and sell things. We need commodifiable things. Mm-hmm. Um, but industry has a tendency to rob people of their humanity. Mm. So industrialism, for a long time, man, I like raged against capitalism, but I, a wise friend of mine actually was like, Dave, it's not capitalism, it's industrialism. And he helped clarify that for me. Hmm. Industrialism, think of it, you know, there's humans doing a, they're making a chair, they're making a piece of furniture, they're expressing something worthwhile for humanity. Oh, I want to give someone a place to sit and rest. Mm -hmm. Not only do I want to do that, but I want to do it so good that it'll last and I want it to be aesthetically beautiful. 
I want to make sure that I carve something so the wood grains uh, soothes people, you know, or something. So, like, there's a human way to build, uh, to cultivate what has been given to us by God and through nature and all that. And then there's a, a mechanized industrial way that takes the human out of the equation and puts profit above everything else. Mm. So profit becomes the chief goal. Well, I could make 200 chairs with a machine in the time it takes a human to make five. And so we're going to make this chair. We're going to try to make it seem human, but ultimately the end goal is profit. It is serving some good. People are going to be able to sit But the actual relationship between human and expression, human and commodity, is lost. Um, And what's happened in specifically our society and specifically in worship music is that profit has has now become synonymous with anointing. When someone sells records, God's Mm. moving with through their song. When a song gets picked up and is played worldwide, that's what God's saying. They don't understand that it was over a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars of marketing mm. to put that song in in the hands of people's phones, and they don't understand that like profit has become synonymous with what God is quote unquote doing. They've taken humanity and the beauty of our self expression what God loves most about us. And we've turned it into, uh, I can't, I'm not going to curse, but a spreadsheet. I want to curse, you know, it's a spreadsheet. That's all it is to a lot of people. So these labels and the worship industry is selling lots of records right now. People are gaining followers. They're gaining uh, this notion that God is with them because of fame and because of profitability Nowhere in Scripture is that a fruit of the Spirit. Nowhere. In fact, it warns us against all the things that we think God is moving. So if I can preach just a moment, um, there is too much emphasis, man. So worship leaders, listen to me. There's too much emphasis on signs and wonders. I believe in signs and wonders. I'm more mystical than most. I'm a full-fledged charismatic. <laughs> hey, uh, I let's love... go ahead and say, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say I... that, that you, we are listening to a bona fide <laughs> Holy Spirit weirdo, and he's yeah. among friends, and this is true. He is yeah. way more freaky-deaky than most of you. Okay, so yeah. now back to the sermon. Yeah. I have wonderful mystical and, and terrifying, what, just crazy things happen to me on a daily basis. Now, I speak in tongues, I prophesy, I, um, when the Lord brings that inspiration through the Holy Spirit, I respond with joy, you know. But the church is to be known by what? The fruits of the Spirit with love being the chief. Come on. It's not to be known by signs and wonders. Are you kidding? Mm. The gifts of the Spirit are very powerful, and I love them. I'm grateful for them. I function in them. But the enemy has, you know, the enemy of our souls has a duplicate for each one of those things, and they're powerful. Like uh, words of knowledge. I have many friends that aren't surrendered to Jesus Christ that have just as strong, if not a stronger words of knowledge gift than these prophets going around telling people their social security cards. Yeah. I had that gift as a, as a young kid, clairvoyance. Mm -hmm. It happens, man. I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, There's loads of things that are powerful and God uses, but the enemy has no, he can't compete with the fruits of the spirit. So what he's doing right now is he's elevating people's attention to all these signs and wonders because he knows he can actually have some footing in that battle. But man, he has lost the battle with the fruits of the Spirit. He can't, he can't defeat any of them. 
If this was Matthew 4, where do you think the worship, where do you think we could be in the industry of worship? Are we standing on top of the temple and we're being promised the world? Are we like, what, does the, does the, is there a, is there a connection there for you? Like what we are, what are we forfeiting for the appearance of, you know, influence and power and uh, fame? Because I, I think it's really important that people understand like, and then I, I have a follow-up that's more connected for the sake of the people that need to worship and the worshipers that need to write. So yeah. do you feel like a, a connection in that? Like what is yeah, the ministry being promised kind of by hell itself to give up what it's actually supposed to carry? What is the exchange that's being made there? I think the exchange is, hey, um, God, God, wants you to ser- God wants you to serve him and make him famous and, and make all these things happen that uh, there's a notion that God needs them. And what they've, they've, I think, exchanged that idea and they've surrendered the beauty of just simply being known by God and knowing God. They've surrendered friendship for fame. When you know God, um, there's a beautiful quote I'd love to share by a mentor I got to spend some time with. He's a blind Jesuit priest named Larry Gillick. He's like a perfect mix of Thomas Merton and Mr. Rogers. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> dude, he exudes the love of Jesus more than I think any other human I've ever met. Wow. And he's blind, and he said something to me that really shocked me, and I wrestled with. And this may come across real weird to some people, but I promise, give me some time to explain it. He said this, we don't serve God. God serves us. Mm -hmm. And we serve with Christ in Christ. We serve the church and the world with Christ and in Christ. Mm-hmm. God, we don't serve God. God serves us. That statement, dude, just shook me to my core because my whole life I felt this empowerment of like, I'm gonna do good things and I'm gonna make God proud and all like yeah. but the actual posture of someone who knows God is actually just hands open receiving his love and then giving what we receive from him to the world that desperately needs it. That's Christianity. That's spiritual life. So people who think that they're like serving God and doing all these things, I'm like, well, um, maybe God doesn't need you. Hmm. Maybe God just simply wants to be your friend. Come on. It's friendship for fame. Yeah. And then the idea of the idea that somehow God needs us to do, as opposed to there's a, there's an enjoyment in the community of God in God's yes. own identity. Just there's such joy. Yeah. Idea, like we're forfeiting the joy of just being together. Yes. With the lofty aspiration of somehow helping him fulfill something. Mm-hmm. I think about my step, my stepdad, Don, he went to a conference a long time ago. This is one of the things that, stuck out to me because he was very much like he's he's a he's a um he's a straight shooter man he's just like he's a good man and he's he he does his best and he is uh he just works really hard to do the right thing like he's a good dude and he told me he was at this conference once it's right after i got saved yeah and i remember he told me you know he had this hero that was this pastor and he was is this dude that's doing a conference and him and my mom are in the audience and he says, who here knows, you know, what they want to do or who they want to be, you know, in God or whatever. And, Mm -hmm. and Don raised his hand and the guy called on him and Don stood up and said, I want to be a faithful servant of the Lord. And, and the guy said, young man, you better be careful. And my stepdad was just like frozen, like what? And the dude's wife is sitting on the stage and she goes, please explain what you mean, dear. (laughs) You know? And he's like, yeah, a servant can work his whole life, but he doesn't have to love. Mm-hmm. And it was like this, like, without love, it's nothing. Yeah. It's, yeah. Nothing. 
thing. So yep. the idea of like, wow, like, so in your mind, so I'm saying this for people that, dude, there are people that if you don't, it's not that you, it's not that you want to be a songwriter. It's not that you want yeah. to praise. It's that if you don't, you die. Like it is mm. real. So if you, if we could speak encouragement yes. to the community of people that are yeah. trying to write what's real for them yeah. and it'll never be popular. Yeah. And the community of people that don't know if it's okay for them to like the stuff that's not popular. Yeah. How do we bridge the gap and say to people, hey, if someone sings your song and no one else knows who they are, sing out with them because yeah. what it creates is your like twilight moment. You yeah. know what I mean? Like we have the opportunity to give that to one another. Like yeah. <laughs> no one will know your favorite worship song, but the dude yeah. that wrote it and you, and that is beautiful. It's what so beautiful. To, like the, there's a whole lot of songwriters and they don't need to focus on fame. What do right. they need to focus on? Yeah. So, I mean, it's so, anyone who has the courage to write a song, God bless you. Come on. Because what I think a song is, as our buddy, you know, you know Ray Hughes. I do. Um, Shout out Ray you know, Hughes. Yeah, man. Get well soon. Yes. Uh, praying for Come you. Come on. Um, like the, a song is in, he calls it an impassioned speech. But I think if I could riff on that a little bit, it's actually having the courage to say who you are mm. and to proclaim uh, who God is in you, you know? And not necessarily with certainty like, <laughs> or with some like, but with honesty and vulnerability. Mm. And so a song, if someone has enough courage to actually open up themselves and say, this is how I feel, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I've journeyed through. They're sharing their story. Man, God bless you. And I think God will bless that courage and I'll bless that faithfulness. Um, and that's going to free people to, yeah. to find also themselves and find God yep. in that. Um, so, so my other encouragement to that is that, you know, we all need to make a living. I'm not opposed to people making a living, writing songs, even Christian songs. But what I am a, what I am opposed to, because I'm an artist, and I'm also fairly punk rock, is when we lose our unique uh, expression, when we become, when our sound gets mechanized and thrown into it becomes a machine in the industrialism of a market yep. um we it loses all of its potency come on it loses its humanity so my encouragement would be to can always write from a very real and uh vulnerable place if you're joyful write a joyful song if you're sad write a sad song and may the Lord meet you in both of those places. Yeah. Um, because that's the point of it. That's, yeah. that's why we do it. Yeah. So, yeah. So like I, I get, like I was just on the phone. I'm producing an incredible uh, couple uh, worship leaders in Sweden. Mm. Uh, and yesterday I was on a FaceTime call with them. And um, there's no, paid worship leaders in sweden yeah yeah none yeah none. that culture is like why would we pay you to do why that would we pay you to do that? <laughs> yeah 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 totally totally and now they look at the states and they're like it's amazing people get paid to do that and they're not jealous of it they're not angry at it. they're just like that's amazing but i looked at them and i said you're amazing come on you lead multiple worship sessions every week with not a thought of any money. Come on. Just relationship. Yep. That's beautiful to me. Yep. Right? My wife can attest this. I, I'm not, I'm not BSing. Like I would do what I do with or without money. Yeah. Because it's who I am. It's what I love. It's, I mm -hmm. feel a sense of more than joy. It's like, it's who I am. I can't, wow. I will always do 
some version of this because this is why I feel like I exist. Um, and so when people can do something as beautiful and as sincere as worshiping God mm -hmm. apart from commodifiability, I'm into it. I think it's so cool. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm also not opposed to people making money. Uh, I think a worker is worth his wages and yeah. the arts are valuable, man. Come on. That's true. Um, so, and Christian art is very valuable. So, um, I just think it comes down to, I'm not going to judge anybody's uh, heart, you know, that motives, that's, that's, that's above my pay grade. That's totally up to the Lord. But caution yourself against fame. Always pursue friendship. And uh, if you're writing a song for money, maybe, maybe don't uh, sing it in church. <laughs> Come on, dude. It's like, if you're going to, you're gonna sell it. That's cool. Just you be real yeah. careful. You don't you don't peddle him because that's not mm -hmm. a joke at all. Um, right. Man, that makes a ton of sense. That's really good. Thank you, Dave. Dang, man. Hmm. Well, let me do this. We'll bring it in for a landing. Cool. If, if people hear this and they like. Um, and their and their heart is in your direction, and they're like, "Whoa!" Um, and they want to believe with you and Ali and with your family. Yeah. What are some things that they can be praying for for you guys in this coming year? Thank you. Well, I would ask for prayer for um, the education of my children in this crazy Corona. <laughs> um, that they would continue their love of learning, even mm -hmm. if it happens to be over a computer screen or away yeah. from their friends. Uh, and specifically that they're, yeah, that they could find this time, this hiddenness, this like a little bit of a hibernation from the normal, uh, that, that God would meet them and, and minister to them and, um, for me as well and for Allie, uh, for continued healing yeah. over Allie and uh, all of our family. And then specifically, I'd love, I'd love a lot of like, I mean, if you want to get hot and heavy with the Lord, be praying for artists like myself who, and more than like myself, like touring, hardworking artists that just lost 80% of their income. Yeah. Because every venue is shut down and may not be able to recover. Um, pray that God gives them imaginative thoughts of how to use their unique uh, creative self-expression to bless the world in this time. And that, uh, that God would be, that humanity would be generous to them. God's mm -hmm. generous to them. He gives them everything they need, but we need to be generous to artists right now because um they're doing the best they can they're trying to make records they're yeah they're, they're doing odd jobs here and there um <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah. it's it's difficult um so just pray for opportunities and generosity to just flood uh artists lives and their families lives mm -hmm. and and even those artists that i get a chance to work with um I don't take lightly that I get paid to help them. Mm -hmm. And so if they're going to take a risk to hire me to help them make something beautiful yeah. that the world can listen to, I want them to be taken care of for. That's super cool. Well, who are some of the people? Um, well, let me pray first. Sorry. Let me pray first for you. And then I will ask this. Thank you. Um, Father, I pray right now for, um, for Dave and for Ali, for their kids. For everybody that's going to hear this and we have kids and like, we don't know what school looks like, or they're going to be at home and parents mm. that aren't sure how to juggle the schedule. And how do I make sure my kids are okay? How do I stay providing for my family in the midst of this kind of pandemic um, universe that we're living in? God, I pray your grace and I pray for the spirit of wisdom 
and revelation over all of our kids um, yeah. into this next school year. I pray for all the teaching staff, all of the people that are trying to make decisions that mm-hmm. feel like life and death for people um, yeah. as it pertains to education, um, you know, lunches, uh, cafeteria programs, uh, lower income families, uh, mm-hmm. people without internet, people without computer, like yeah. making all these decisions. We just pray for the school system in America and yes, all God. the kids that that system represents that you administer to everyone there. Mm-hmm. Pray God for, um, for Allie, just for her physical body, for her mind, mm-hmm. her will, and her emotions, God, that you administer to her and speak to her, encourage her and strengthen yeah. her with might. And I pray God for um, all of the musicians and the creative people, the beautiful artists that their life and their livelihood and their, their future, their present Mm -hmm. has just taken a massive hit as everything gets shut down. And so I pray for creativity and I pray God for new businesses and I pray for um, new opportunities for them. And I pray God that you would, they would not, uh, they wouldn't run out of money and end up doing dumb work. I pray that they wouldn't forfeit their dream in the midst mm-hmm. of a time like this and just pray for Dave. I pray for amazing business and, and actual like creative blessing that just shows up at his doorstep. And I, I just pray for his work as well. And so God, thank you for the generation of people that are they're after you and they want to connect with your heart and they're mm-hmm. brave enough to sing their song. I just pray for yeah. them right now. And I just pray for the, the next wave of worship leaders singer songwriters dancers poets Mm -hmm. like prophets all of them god i pray that you would steer them away from losing their humanity for Mm -hmm. forfeiting their sound god we say would you please would you please protect them from the Mm -hmm. industry that would steal their humanity and steal their expression god um friendship over fame and profit god relationship Mm -hmm. over all these other things in Jesus name. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, bro. So how about this? Who are some people? Let's say there's some people that are like, I don't like music. Yeah. Not not when Christians make it. Anyways, I'm just joking. But who are some people that you would put, you'd put on like, you're like, Hey, everyone that's ever going to hear this. I need you to listen to my friends. Bop, bop, bop. Like do some worshipy praiser artist. drop some names, do some Let, I want to know who it is that you think, hey, these guys are gifts to give to the world. Everyone should check them out, support them, message them, let them know your favorite song. Who are the people that you would put on right now? Yeah, I mean, I'm really blessed to have lots of great friends that I love their music. Um, yeah, some some at the like top of the list. It's like, well, I'll try to give several different genres, but... Um, Dear friends like Zach Winters, he has uh, beautiful music that always seems to be, I'm able to encounter friendship with my family and with God when his music is on. Um, uh, other great friend, like friends like, uh, there's a band called Towers, uh, they're from Flagstaff, Arizona, and they write music that I f- always think is so beautiful and holds tension mm. uh, uh, lyrically. It, it's um, wonderful um, songs that are, you know, they're not willing, they're, they're, they're okay pushing up against certain things that a lot of people may didn't know that you can push up against and that God can meet you there. So yeah. Towers is really cool. Uh, I love uh, my dear friend Jason Upton. Mm. He's he is like, I think I was explaining to you over the phone that he's just his music is beautiful and wholesome, mm. meaning it's like like organic. There's no um, weird fake chemicals in it it'll be good it's like vegetables for your for your spirit you know yeah uh, and so I, I really encourage people to sit with his music and his lyrics and um i love my buddy aaron strumpel makes beautiful spiritual music uh josh garrels is a dear friend that i love and, oh his and, new his new one is really great i was yeah. really encouraged by it man especially because he did in the garden 
Such a That's good like, song. I sing that over Chris, Chrissy's brother-in-law. His his mama was dying, and uh, I, I it popped up. This was like 15 years ago. Yeah. And I sat with her, and I I was like, I don't know why, but I just want to sing this song over you. And I sang the song over her, and it was about you know. He walks with me and talks with me and tells me I'm and she's just crying. She's like, that was one of my favorite. She had this beautiful rose garden and it was like a whole thing. When I heard him sing it, I was like, yes, yes, there's one of them. That's yeah, so good. Yeah. Good. He's, yeah. And he's yeah. got a gorgeous voice, like such a beautiful Dude, voice. yeah, he's he's legit. He he covers one of my songs called Wash Me Clean on that record, which that's, is so, that's so right. cool. That's yeah. super cool. Anyways, um, that's a good one, Josh Carroll's. That's a good one. I Yeah. And then there's all these other people. So I always encourage people to, to find music that has no lyrics because um, if you can't hear God in the silence, you, you won't be able to hear him with words. <laughs> so you, yeah. you got you to gotta start cultivating some, some hiddenness with God and some, some just being together, you know? Yeah. Uh, it won't always be hot and heavy, <laughs> uh, but it always be good. And so I, I try to cultivate a beautiful uh, instrumental uh, library. Some of my favorites are, um, I love Steve Reich. I love Arvo Parr. I love A Winged Victory for the Solon. I love this uh, band called Deadlight. I love, um, there's so many beautiful pieces of music that when I, play it it occupies a space that i can just rest in yeah and so i think let's be honest we're so inundated with what we should see and what we should read and what we should listen to so sometimes it's just nice to to sit with a piece of art that isn't occupying much space it's yeah. just inviting us into our own thoughts and our own prayers and I think God loves to occupy that space with us too. So um, those are some that I really love. Uh, this, this guy, Slow Meadow, he's also a wonderful, wonderful composer. Um, Dustin O'Halloran, he's amazing. Yeah, a bunch of like minimalism, new classical, uh, simple stuff. I love it. It's awesome. It's awesome. I might have you text me some of them. I'm going to copy them and I'll put them in the cool. show notes. Yeah. And people can see. So just like, it's, it's just nice. Again, it's nice just to know. I, mm -hmm. I do think it's like information overload a lot of times. And yeah. if, if like Jesus, if presence music gets relevated to the same box of like the rest of the information, it just mm -hmm. it loses everything for me. And then I'm like, I'm just, I'm, yeah. just, I'm nothing more than a consumer in that moment. And I like, and then I'm like lost. I think it's like, Oh, this lost my whole identity. I have no idea. Yeah. Are you even real anymore? <laughs> was this all it ever was, was like a bunch of people trying to sell me some record about how much they love you. And I don't believe them. Is that weird? <laughs> to me? So, you know, I'm like, okay. Oh, one of the, and yeah. And one of the most beautiful things too is, um, Arvo Parr. Do, are you familiar with him at all? Mm -mm. So he's, he's an Eastern Orthodox uh, composer, uh, super influential man. Like he, he's the real deal. And <laughs> talk about, he can sit in suffering and tension and music mm. with, with the Holy Ghost in the midst of some pretty radical bummer stuff, you know? So he's an Eastern Orthodox dude. Um, I forget where he's from. Anyways, his music, uh, if anyone's really wanting to take a deep dive, it's just so bathed in him spending time with God. And uh, he has this beautiful um, saying that his job as a composer is to be tuned. He is the instrument. Yeah. And God tunes him. His response to God is simply to allow God to tune him. And so that's another encouragement to all the worship leaders and stuff. Hey, don't tune, don't allow the industry to tune you. Allow the spirit of God to touch you and to tune you so that you can resonate yeah. the unique love of God through your voice, through your instrument. Um, so yeah, Arvo, Arvo Parr is amazing. Gosh, that's so good. Super good. <laughs> Super Dude, good. I'll, have to say, I'll send you a video of, uh, of him 
that you can ask, not on the podcast, but you, I, I, every time I watch it, I get into like fetal position. And <laughs> it like, wrecks me so bad. <laughs> and I just like, the Lord's like, yeah, you know, and, uh, uh, but it's like, if you want to see a, a video of what I hope to be like when I'm 80, Whoa. it's, uh, it's this dude, that, you know, that's so sick. Yeah. Holy smokes, man. <laughs> that's powerful, bro. Yeah. Well, dang, what about this? Is there, okay. I'll say this before we go. Um, do you have anything in the midst of this conversation? Do you have like a parting shot? Do you have anything you feel like? Yeah, you I'd love to. You I'd, okay. I just, I'd love I was to. thinking about it. Like, what do you want Thank to say you. before we get done? I, yeah. What I want to say is that I, I want people to know that um, I said a few things with uh, a lot of um, conviction and a lot of emotion. You know, I remember I said something about I'm going to vomit and a few other things. I, I really believe this stuff and okay. feel it deeply. However, um, in the kingdom of God, the loud voice isn't the one that I think all, that, that falls on the, on, on the ears of the Lord. I think there's something really beautiful about his tenderness and his gentleness. And, um, and right now, uh, my hope is uh, that I, was, I didn't come across too um, argumentative or something, but the Lord's really touched me in my life, and I've learned to love people that I never thought I'd be able to love, and I've learned to engage in beautiful conversation with people that I never thought I would have the patience or um, care in my heart to hear them out. And right now, I think the world needs that. It needs the fruit of the Spirit, specifically loving kindness um, more than ever. And uh, so be kind to yourself. Be kind to your friends. Be, fr be kind to your community. Don't involve yourself in uh, kind of meaningless arguments. Um, but it's okay to have good, hard conversations. Um, and invite God into those specifically. Ask that God would just manifest the fruits of the Spirit in every conversation you have. Yeah, I read a I read a tweet the other day that was like a, by the student. It was the parable of the man. You know, he talks about like how there's a guy at the temple and. One of them is a is a you know Pharisee guy or whatever, and he's like, I tithe and I give and blah blah, and I'm so glad I'm not like this dude over here, and yeah. you know I do all the right things, I do the right things for the right reasons, and I show up and I'm blah blah. And then the and I, I used to cry every time I read the parable just because yeah. it's like a heart cry. Yeah, for me is the other dude. It says it says that it might mess me up as I say it. <clears throat> it says that he couldn't even look. He was just like. I can't even look to heaven because I'm so yeah. sort of embarrassed and I, and I'm so aware of my deficiency Yeah. and I'm so, I'm so aware of how powerful and holy and maybe awesome the creator would be. And then yeah. there's me and that idea of him beating his breast and just saying, God have mercy on me. Right. And God and Jesus saying the dude that's aware <laughs> is going to go home justified. <laughs> before that. And I'm real, I'm saying to me, I can be, and I'm friends with a lot of people that are the coolest Christians I know. Right. And man, we're looking at a lot of other Christian people. And I think not for nothing, I wouldn't want to be them yeah. standing before the Lord. Yeah. And it's right in that moment that God's like, you sure about that Greeno? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, sorry about that. God yeah. have mercy on me that's all i got right now and yeah. i'm so pissed as a christian guy watching so many people i know i have such deep judgment and yeah. frustration and anger and i'm i'm trying to hold the tension of peacemaker meaning right. let's make peace everywhere and oh my God, I have, I'm, I'm drunk on my own judgment. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. Woo! I'm looking that's... at contemporaries and peers and going like, oh, I cannot believe which, and then it's that moment of like, do yeah. you think you're better than them? And I'm like, right. 
I do. I really do. I think you like me more <laughs> than you like them. And it's like, oh, snap. I'm like, there's like hellfire nipping at my heels right now. Oh, yeah. I am so uh, yeah. full of judgment. So yeah. I like the way that you said that, just to, to be kind and to have conviction. I don't mind our conviction at all, but right. I think that's a living parable for a lot of us right mm-hmm. now is when we look at the other side and go, God, I'm so glad I'm not like you. Man, yeah. I, I say it all the time. It's in that moment that Jesus goes, I'm going to go stand with them for a second to block your judgment over them. Like, don't. Yeah, that's and I'm so like, true, man. Oh, but I want to judge. Oh, I so bad. I'm like, you're yeah. like apologizing and you were so kind. And I feel like, oh, no, do you need me to judge? Because I'll jump in <laughs> and be like, what he meant to say was, but it's, you're totally it, right. Like there's, and it's okay to hold the tension of, I love people that I don't agree with. Yeah. That's very difficult. Yeah. God loves all of us <laughs> equally. That's, that'll mess you up. People are scared of God's love way more than his judgment, I think, personally. That's real. Um, That's so, real. So it's Gosh. like we have to be able to, to learn how to love like that. Um, and when the church... When we, as followers of Jesus, can learn to love like he loves, that is going to be something. Yeah. That's going to transform the world. That's going to transform our relationships. And, um, yeah, enough with this divisive stuff, you know. Let's let's learn how to be grown-ups and graduate sixth grade. And, um, and hey... If someone can't be loved and love someone that they disagree with, then like God be with them, teach them how to be an adult, you know? Yeah. That's what adulthood is and should be. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a <laughs> lot of compromise and there's a lot of understanding and there's a yes. lot of patience yes. that comes with disagreement. Yeah. It's super good, man. Gosh, okay. A, thank you for clarifying yet again yeah. that you're not trying to be a jerk. I'm you, not. <laughs> but your pla- the place in you that you create from, the place in you that you serve from, the place in you that God has met you, it comes from a place of there's fire, there's conviction, yeah. there's, there's, a burning, there's a burning intensity in who you are, mm-hmm. even as an introvert trying yeah. to serve. It's like and you're an intense dude. Underneath yeah. all of the night, true. there's the tent. It's, it's like, yeah, I, I do can't. like to fight. <laughs> I like to fight a lot. That's, so that's the part where I'm like, okay, so yeah. I appreciate that. Well, um, okay, please text me the names of all of your favorites, okay. and I'll put those in the show notes. Um, if people want to reach out to you, and I'm saying, like, if they've got, if they've been maybe saving or they want to do a project or they're, they yeah. are doing stuff, how do people find you in terms of if, if they ever wanted to pursue uh, completing a recording project with you, or if yeah. they just want to follow you in general, how do people find you? Yeah, so um, I am on the, uh, you know, socials. I, I'm not super active, but I, I'm trying to be more accessible as it matches with my emotional health. <laughs> um, but a boy and his kite is like, I have uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook all under a boy and his kite. For my, specifically for my studio work, for, you know, my, uh, what I'm cultivating here uh, in Colorado for serving artists and trying to help uh, with their projects, it's all via DaveWilton.com. And there, there's a link you can check out albums I'm, I've worked on, I'm working on, you can see the studio, uh, I list all the gear I use if people get into that stuff, and then there's a contact page, and if you reach out via that contact page, I will get back to you. It may not be immediate, but I will get back to you and oh, uh, have a conversation. Oh, a boy and his kite on socials, if you're uh-huh. interested in, in really the the getting some songs wrangled by the studio yeah. master Dave. It's at yeah. <laughs> Dave Wilton, DaveWilton.com. Yes. My friend, my brother, I love you a lot. Dude, Thank love you, you too. All right. Bro, well. that, uh, that phrase, drunk on judgment, is like Shakespearean, dude. That's so good. <laughs> I'm going to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I feel like I, I literally, I just, I'm saying, I, I'm amazed at, I can tell where I'm at. I can go from zero to that in yeah. one and one half tweets or um, one of my best friends was like, Hey, what do you think of blank? 
And then 19 minutes later, I got done talking and was like, oh, sorry, bro. What do you think? And he's like, it was about the same. I just didn't have all the language for it. And I was like, that's good. So I just, I'm aware of how fast. I, I, I know it comes from, it comes from a lot of painful emotions, like fear yeah. and hurt and shame and guilt. Like, but I'm just amazed at how fast I get hit with that. And then just yeah. the anger just gets turned up. <laughs> and then I add volume and eloquence and it oh, just yeah, dude. starts going. And I'm like, you can. man, I, I, strung a, I strung a little line of cuss words together on that one. That was pretty good, dude. <laughs> dude, the cadence was just, uh, yeah, Shakespeare would be it. proud, I was a man. Drummer. I'm a drummer, okay? <laughs> yeah, I started dude. in the back. I was like, yeah, what's up? And then I was like, I can do that. Uh, Anyways. All right. Well, I love you a lot. Well, love you too, man. Thanks for having me on the podcast and love to you and your sweet family. Thanks, man. Those of you guys, thanks for checking it out. Uh, the Rev Gatherings at gmail.com. You can visit us at therevgatherings.com. See you next time. Hey, you guys. Tommy Green here. Just want to say thank you again for listening to this episode of the Rev Talks podcast. Our hope with each and every episode is that it would encourage you, maybe give you a reason to have a laugh, expand your capacity on the inside to love and empathy, appreciation, hopefully make your world just a little bit bigger and uh, give you faith, hope for the future. If you like what you heard, again, please share, subscribe, give us a good rating, give us some good feedback. Over all of this, thank you so much for taking us with you uh, in a small part of your day, on the drive, on, on the run, you know, just as you're going about your day. Thank you so much for sharing uh, some time of your life with us on this podcast. Um, to connect with us, you can email us again at therevgatherings.com and we will see you on the next episode. Love you guys. Bye.